Hey there. I got a letter from my friend Sol07G about a game that I need to talk about. Earlier this week, he told me it was a game that released in 1986, is extremely difficult, and it released on the Famicom and NES. I'm actually pretty excited about this because I have a pretty good idea of what game he wants me to review. This game is the first game in one of my favorite franchises of all time. You know the one. The one where you storm the castle, strike the monsters down, reveal the Lord of Darkness every 100 years, fight for the good of all mankind, and bring honor to the legendary family legacy? Yeah, that one. Like I said, I'm really excited to talk about this game. Man, uh, are, are you sure this is the game you wanted me to review? Yep. Because this isn't exactly what I was thinking. Well, are you thinking about it now? I was more thinking Castlevania. Yeah, okay, whatever. You can do that later. But as of right now, this very moment, you are doing Kid Icarus. Kid Icarus is a game that is, well, existent, that's for sure. After the success of Metroid on NES by Nintendo R&D, Toru Usawa, who joined the company in 1985, wanted to make a game that was similar to Metroid, an action game with RPG elements. He was always interested in Greek mythology, so this was pretty much a passion project for him, and Kid Icarus was also Usawa's debut as a video game developer, and at the beginning of the game's development, he was the only one working on it. Over time during the game's development, more and more people joined in on working on the game, but it was still a very small development team for the time. Kid Icarus had a very tight release date, which was December 19th, 1986, so to save time and resources, they used the same engine as Metroid, along with Kid Icarus of Myths and Monsters on Game Boy, which shared Metroid 2, the return of Samus' engine. Even with those saved resources, the deadline was still extremely hard to meet, this wasn't like nowadays where you can upload videos saying that you have to delay your game to a future date. No, you had to get it done by the initial release date. This proved to be very difficult for Osawa and the team members, so much so that they had to work through nights in an unheated building, and they had to use cardboard boxes and window curtains as bedding. Yep, you heard that right. The development team basically had to risk their lives and survive while making this. The game was completed and produced just three days before its release date, which is absolutely insane. It was released in Japan on its previously mentioned date, December 19th, 1986, and for North American and PAL territories, it was released in 1987. The reception? It was alright. People said it was fine, but it wasn't gonna blow anyone away anytime soon. People also criticized it for being way too hard, which is understandable, but also unfair. NES games from 1986 through 1991 are notoriously difficult. Games like Castlevania, Contra, Ninja Gaiden, Mega Man, Punch-Out, Blaster Master, and those are some of the most critically acclaimed games for the console. So what exactly made Kid Icarus different? Well, let's find out. This is Kid Icarus for the Nintendo Entertainment System. When we boot up the game, we are greeted with a surprisingly beautiful title screen, and a title theme that has become iconic over the years. The problem with this theme, though, is that it's extremely high-pitched and it's making my ears bleed. Seriously, guys, I need help. Before we get into the game, let's dive into the plot. The Angel Land story is that there were two goddesses, them being Palutena, the goddess of light, and Medusa, the goddess of darkness. Palutena provided the light so that men could grow their own food so they could live. Medusa found happiness in starving humans for some sick reason, so she dried out and destroyed the food. So yeah, if you ever see a head of wilting lettuce in your fridge, blame Medusa. Since Medusa was bad, Palutena turned her into a horrific monster and was sentenced to the underworld, but she had promised that she would eventually have her revenge on Palutena and take control of the palace in the sky. That time eventually came. Medusa had sparked a war. Palutena and her army fought an incredible fight, but in the end, Medusa's army was just too strong. She overtook the palace in the sky, turned most of Palutena's army into stone, stole the three sacred treasures in the palace, and Palutena herself was locked in the palace with her power dwindling, and hope to be victorious was dwindling as well. But it turns out, hope wasn't lost after all. When Palutena was in her prison chamber, she remembered someone. Someone who was imprisoned by Medusa in the underworld during the war. This someone was... Pit. A young angel has to travel the underworld, 
Overworld, and Skyworld to defeat the gatekeepers of the fortresses, to get the three sacred treasures back, to go to the Palace in the Sky to defeat Medusa, and to save Palutena. This is one of the best stories for an NES game ever in my opinion. You definitely have to credit Osawa and the dev team for this one. This is a pretty epic tale. Now, how was it actually executed on the NES? It isn't. When we start the game, Pit is right outside of his prison chamber in the Underworld, and as previously mentioned, he has to climb back up to the palace in the sky. This is where we control Pit, and for the most part, it's an easy task. For the most part. Move with the D-pad, shoot arrows with the B button, and jump with the A button. Sounds pretty easy, but it is much easier said than it is done. You can only shoot arrows as high as you can jump, and as far as a few steps forward. You can't really snipe enemies like this, you have to get pretty close to enemies to actually use your bow, which is kind of lame. If you happen to get hit, which you will, there's glasses of wine to help restore your life, and if you die, it's back to the beginning of the level. I do like that there aren't any lives in this game. For a game like this, I'd much rather just start back at the beginning of the level when I die instead of losing all my lives and getting a game over with only like three continues. If it was like that, I'm not sure if I would have ever beat this game, because this game is absolutely agonizing with its difficulty. Well, what? What? Why? What? No, 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 no. God, this is insane. When th this is so stupid. I hate this. What was that? No! This game is so unmerciful towards you in a lot of ways. Sometimes it's understandable. It's a fair difficulty. And then there's other times where it's so stupid the way you die sometimes. One example of that is this. If you press down on the D-pad, Pit will duck down. Again, it's pretty standard stuff. However, if Pit is on a semi-solid platform when he ducks down, he will go right through, just like it never existed. And if you go through the bottom of the screen, you're instantly dead. Anyway, there's overall 13 levels, with 9 of them being scrolling platforming levels, 3 being boss fortresses, and the last one being the final level where you fight Medusa. The actual side-scrolling platforming levels are definitely the best part of the game. In the Underworld and in Skyworld, you climb up to the top of the level, using the sides of the screen to go back around to the other side, like Balloon Fighter Mario Brothers. But in the Overworld, it's just classic left-to-right platforming. There's a lot of doors in these levels. There's also shops and endurance rooms, which if you pass the test, you get a power item. Huh. Wait, what, what's this? That's weird, I, I can't use them right now. Oh, maybe I can only use them in a boss fortress. Yeah, that could be it. Anyway, back to the levels. The actual platforming is pretty good. It can be awkward sometimes with the tiny platforms, but platforming is still fun. The thing that makes these levels hard is just the abundance of enemies. There are over 40 enemies in this game, and you better bet that they all suck. There's a few in particular that are just really annoying. There's rock men which just fall down out of nowhere. Like seriously, there's no judging where these things are going to be. They just appear. There's mono eyes, which are like the second type of enemy you see, but still, these things are such a chore to deal with. They fly around in a group of four, which is a recurring thing with the enemies. They always travel in fours for some reason. Anyway, yeah, they just fly around for a short period of time and swoop down and catch Pit off guard. They're much easier to deal with than the Rockmen, but still, man, these can be annoying. Then there's Octos. Most of the time, these appear around the end of the level, and they just chase after you. Most likely, you won't get an opportunity to kill these guys. You just have to outrun them. The most annoying enemy by far, though, for the platforming levels are the Reapers. The Reapers themselves don't really attack unless they run into you, but if they see you, they'll go in this weird fit of rage and call down Repets, which are so small and annoying, they just swarm around you and hit you. But like I said, they're so incredibly small, they are so hard to hit! I do like both the vertical and horizontal levels pretty much equally. They're really challenging, which isn't a bad thing, but it does get really annoying here and there as I mentioned. But when you learn how the game works after some time, you can get some fun out of these. Alright, now we have the Gatekeeper Fortresses. If you enjoyed the nice linear platforming that the earlier levels had, this game will keep all of the annoying things that make those levels annoying and take those fun parts about those levels and just burn it right in front of you. What on earth is this infernal trash heap on this printed circuit board? These are flat out awful. What happened to the linear platforming? Sure, it had its annoying moments, but I still found them enjoyable. Now we get these labyrinth maze levels where you just have to guess where you're going. In the first fortress, there are 30 rooms, and there's so many dead ends and enemies. Oh, but wait, that's just the first one. The second one has 50 rooms, and the third one has 64 rooms. Why did they feel the need to do this? 
I just find this absolutely absurd. There are so many enemies, and it's so easy to get lost. There is a way to track your position, but it's not like in Zelda where you find a map in the dungeon. You have to buy two items to track yourself, the pencil and the torch. You can't even use these items right away either, because you need to find the check sheet, which is just sitting somewhere in some random room, so you have to run around willy-nilly just to find a stupid piece of paper. So then I can spend my hard-earned money on items just to know where on earth I'm going. Oh yeah, there's also these paint brains, the eggplant wizards. They go around throwing these special eggplants, and if Pit gets hit by one, he himself will turn into an eggplant. And the really funny thing about being an eggplant is that you can't attack, so you can't defeat the gatekeepers. You have to seek out a room with someone who will heal the eggplant curse in the fortress. There's only one of these rooms in the first fortress, two in the second, and one again in the third fortress. So if you're in the third fortress and you get hit by an eggplant, which is very likely, you have to wander around the fortress to find one room out of 64. Most of the time there's two eggplant wizards in a room, and they throw the eggplants in this weird overarching angle, so they're pretty hard to dodge, which makes them probably the most annoying enemy in the entire game. Around the fortresses, you can find Centurions that were in Palutena's army that were turned into stone by Medusa. Pit can free the Centurions by using mallets. Yeah, not sure how that works. I think they would just disintegrate if you smash them, but hey, what do I know? When you free them, they'll help you out during the fight with the fortress gatekeeper. Look how much these guys help out. No wonder Palutena's army lost the war. Just look at these guys. They live for a few seconds, and bam, they're dead. Speaking of these gatekeepers, by the way, they're almost as pathetic as the Centurions. Like, seriously, why are these fights the easiest part of the game? They don't really do anything that's mind-blowing. They just kind of go around doing their own thing. Why did they make it so easy? So yeah, the fortress levels, not so great. They could have made it similar to the platforming levels, but no, they made these maze levels that are just a chore to go through. Alright, here is the final level. After collecting all three sacred treasures from the fortress gatekeepers, Pit is able to fight Medusa after going through the stage, and oh good grief, this is insane! Throw out everything that the game taught you before, and make way for this new playstyle. Now, Pit has light arrows which allows for much more range, the mirror shield which absorbs projectiles when you're not attacking, and the wings of Pegasus which allows Pit to fly all around the stage. I gotta say, this is really cool. I wish this playstyle was used more often instead of only being in this wretched level. This level is so long, and the reason why it's so long is so dumb. The level just loops a bunch of times. Okay, I have to get some answers. Why does it keep looping? Let me look at the manual. You have to fight fiercely and win many battles? What? This could mean so many things. Did I miss a fight somehow? What did I do wrong? Alright, after doing some research and trying to get answers from the public, it turns out you have to kill 50 enemies in this stage, or it will just keep looping infinitely. Man, I sure am glad that the manual told me that! This level is already hard enough as is. I've already gotten this far. I've went through all the garbage that this game has threw at me. I've been turned into an eggplant. I bloody deserve to fight Medusa! Anyway, we're finally here in Medusa's palace. And... Why is this the easiest fight in the entire game? All of this, just for an absolute cakewalk. This is pathetic. You just have to keep going up and down because once you get in this weird rhythm, the projectiles won't hit you and the snake won't either. I'm kind of speechless about this. This game has been absolutely ruthless up to this point. What, what happened? All right, we finally did it. We have freed Palutena from her prison chamber and Angel Land is now at peace. Wait, that, 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 wait, that, 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 that's it? Huh. Well, that was a sucky ending. Am I missing, like, a key plot point or something? Maybe there's something in the manual. Oh, wait, here's an answer for why my weapons weren't working. Because I haven't got enough strength? What does that mean? How am I supposed to get more strength? Oh, wait, I have to get points? I have to get a high score just for Pit to get stronger? That's stupid. There are so many small factors in this game that can lead to so many different things. It didn't have to be this cryptic. Oh hey, I found something relating to the ending sequence. Wait, are you serious? There are multiple endings, depending on how skillful I was. 
Okay, this is where I draw the line. Can the game explain to me what being skillful is? Is it referring to how many times I died, how many times I got hit, how fast I beat the level? I don't know. They could have told me, but no. Even going back to the one question about getting points to help me get more strength and level up, it doesn't tell me in the manual how many points I have to get. I just have to guess. Why is this game so horrible at explaining things? I beat the game with the worst weapon, and I also got the worst ending just because the game or the manual didn't explain it to me. This is insane! Alright, that was pretty much Kid Icarus. It's one of the most cryptic games I have ever played. It is extremely frustrating, and it didn't have to be this way. But you see, the thing is, as much as I say this game isn't great, I still respect it. And I actually kind of like it. It's stupid, that's never gonna change. But it being the way that it is with its crypticism, extreme difficulty for no reason at points, and knowing what the developers of the game had to do to make this game even exist, it all gives the game a unique, charming quality. So yeah, Kid Icarus is one heck of a thing, that's for sure. Oh yeah, since I'm done talking about Kid Icarus, I guess I can call Soul 07 g back and tell him what I thought about the game. What do you want? You're never picking a game for me ever again.